Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Heavenly Father who points us to Jesus and says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. May the Lord grant us his grace to always listen to the voice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the text for this Transfiguration Sunday is the story of the Transfiguration as recorded in Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to read this story once again. We'll be looking at this story in more detail this morning. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and, the, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the, the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is our text. Dear brothers and sisters, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our true God and Lord. The, the weather right now is amazing. Yesterday, I wasn't sure what season we were in. And today, it looks like a nice day, too. 40, in the mid-40s, the sun was shining. I'm, I'm worried the trees are starting to bud. They're confused, too, on the seasons. So it's hard to tell if it's, what season is it? Well, today, in, in this service, in this celebration of the transfiguration of Christ, we are transitioning into a new season. I'm not talking about one of the four seasons of the calendar year. I'm not talking about winter, spring, summer, or fall. But I'm talking about the church here. And our church, among other churches, not all churches, we celebrate and we follow a church year. We follow the seasons of the church year. And according to my calculation, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's six seasons in the church year. So let's count them out. We'll start with Advent. So Advent... Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. Okay, we'll get test later on that, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. So do you know which season we're leaving as of today and entering into starting Wednesday? We all know the season, right? We're leaving Epiphany. This is the last Sunday of Epiphany. And we're moving into Lent. Lent, of course, is the season that we focus on the great work of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and going to the cross for us, in suffering and dying for us. And, of course, it culminates with Good Friday in the season of Lent. And then we move into Easter and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Before we know it, it's going to be here. It's just amazing how fast things go. But today is the crescendo, you might say, the highlight, if you will, of the season of Epiphany, the season of revealing. Of course, the Lord was revealed as a little child. He was revealed as the Savior for the Gentiles because the wise men came from the East. And he was revealed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We saw that in his baptism. He was revealed in the scriptures during the season of Epiphany as the Lord of creation and the one who has power over illnesses and, and disasters and demons and so forth. And so he is revealed as powerful, as authority. As he spoke as one who had authority, we heard some of the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of that sermon in chapter 7 of Matthew, the people were, they marveled. They said he spoke as one who had authority, not like the ones we're used to hearing, the scribes and the teachers of the law, but he had authority. And now today, we see him on the mount. 
And it is revealed clearly to those three disciples that this is the Lord himself. So we're going to look at this story this morning. Now, what you can do is you can just listen to me, or you can listen to me and you can follow along in a Bible. There's a Bible in front of you, and I'm going to uh, use the Bible to give a context here. So uh, feel free to turn in your Bible to the Pew Bible to page 1045. That's the text we have today, and I'm gonna, I want to start out with just the first couple of words in this text. I just read it earlier, but now I want to focus on this, where it says, and after six days. That starts the setting for the going up on the Mount of Transfiguration. But what happened after six days? What is the context here? So if you have your Bible open, if you want to look at chapter 16 on page 1044, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the, the, the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do they say that I am, the Son of Man? And they answered, they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter speaks up. He replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter had a big day there. He had a great moment. He, was, he said the right thing. He knew, and it was revealed to him by the Father, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, yes, you're correct. And he was complimented in his confession of faith. And Jesus said later that upon this confession that I am the Christ, I will build my church. And that's what he meant by that next part. But then notice very quickly in verse 21 and 16, it says, from that time, Jesus began. So he began to te te teach them important things. He says, he began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, listen to what Peter responds here. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter couldn't handle that news that Jesus revealed to his disciples, that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. And he mentioned to be raised again, but it was like they didn't hear that. And Peter said, no, Lord, may this never be. And Jesus said to him, he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then he goes into talking about the way of the cross. And you can read that for yourself. And then in verse 28, right before 17, he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, there's some mystery there, but this is the context here. Peter going from making the good confession to the doubting and the resistance of God's plan. And we can be familiar with that because sometimes we do that too. And then he takes them up on the mountain. So let's take a look at the next words. So Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now this was not the first time that Jesus took Peter, James and John privately with him. Can you think of another time earlier in the history of Jesus' life and his work? Well, it happened in, when he went up earlier into the home of Jairus and his daughter had died. And so he went to the room where the, her body was laying. He said to the, those who were mourning and weeping, she's only asleep. And they laughed at him. Of course, she was dead. And as far as the Lord is concerned for his children, death is only asleep. But he, she was dead, and he went into the room, and he took Peter, James, and John, perhaps as witnesses, wherever two or three 
They are witnesses. That was a common thing. And they went into that room. They had the privilege of watching and listening as Jesus called out to that dead little girl, little girl, I say to you, arise. And she got up. The next time is right here on the Mount of Transfiguration, where they were witnesses of his glory. And also, we see in the Transfiguration, he reveals himself to them to strengthen them for the work that he had to do. The third time that I found where Peter, James, and John were with the Lord was during Lent, on Monday, Thursday, in the Garden of Gethsemane where he went out to pray and he took Peter, James, and John with him and he said, stay here and watch and pray with me and then he went a little farther and he prayed. We'll be hearing more about that in the weeks to come. And then it says, and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. The gospel writers who recorded this event were Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they tried to explain in words what was going on. Obviously, he was transfigured before them, and he started to shine. His face shone like the sun, it says, and his clothes became white as light. Mark has an interesting way of putting it. He said his clothes became so dazzling white that no bleach on earth could make him so clean and bright. I think it's kind of interesting. And, of course, Luke emphasizes the appearance of his face had changed. And there was a great splendor there. So he was starting to give them a little glimpse of his majesty and glory as the true God who made the world and came into the world to bring salvation. And then it says, And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So there were witnesses from the Old Testament that came. Moses and Elijah. We all know about Moses, right? He was the one who delivered the people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, out of slavery. The ten plagues, we remember when they were out in, next to the Red Sea and the armies were coming from Pharaoh, coming behind. God said to Moses, put your staff over the water and God opened up the waters and they went through on dry ground delivering them. Today we heard this, a glimpse of the story of where Moses went up on the mountain to collect God's law for the benefit of his people. So Moses was that great lawgiver who delivered the people out of slavery and brought them to the promised land. It took 40 years. And then we know that Moses didn't make it into the promised land. He saw the land from the mountain, and God says, you're not going to go in. You're going to die. I used to be bothered by that. All of that time, all of that effort, he still couldn't make it into the promised land, but actually he did make it into the promised land because when he died, he went to heaven. And this is confirmation that he was with the Lord forever. He came on this event, at this event, and spoke with Jesus. And Elijah was there too. Elijah, the champion prophet who beat those prophets of Baal, we read in the Old Testament. We also know that he went into heaven in a fiery chariot. He was one of two people who did not die but went straight to heaven. And Elijah was one of them. And they were there talking with Jesus. Luke tells us what they were talking about. They were talking about his departure from Jerusalem. Talking about Lent. Talking about his work of salvation. And so, what an amazing sight to be held by these disciples. I think it would leave most of us speechless. But not Peter. He was not speechless. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. Let's just stay here. I'll make shelters for you, if you want. Three tents, one for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Wouldn't that be wonderful that we could just stay here? Well, what do you think about that idea? Luke tells us that he didn't know what he was saying. He had to say something. And sometimes we have our ideas about the way things should be, and they really aren't the way that God would have them be. And we need, like Peter, correction. And so he gets it. While he was still speaking, when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
And now we see a different reaction. It says that the disciples were filled with fear. They fell on their faces. They were terrified. And we can picture that, can't we? They were in the presence of the holy God, and the voice of the Father spoke, and they fell down to the ground. And now we have a detail that only Matthew tells us. And this is when it says, But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. He's the one that tells us that detail. Our gentle Jesus comes over to them while they're on the ground, trembling with fear. He puts his hand on them, a touch of grace and mercy, and he says, Rise, have no fear. And they lifted up their eyes. They looked at Jesus, and the bright cloud was gone. The voice of the Father, this holy voice of the Father, was silent. The great heroes of the Old Testament had no doubt gone back into the glories of eternal life in heaven. The dazzling bright display of his deity was gone. His deity was still there, but that appearance was gone, hidden from them again for the sake of their frailty. And all they saw was Jesus only. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Jesus only. I want you to think about that. What blessings are found with Jesus only? We hear a lot of voices in this world that speak to us and tell us things. But the voice of Jesus only is the voice that comforts and guides us into all truth. Of all the ideas that we are given in the world and the ideas that we come up ourselves with, it is only the word of Jesus only that we can truly depend upon for our lives. When the holy law of God does its work, and you know the work of, the, of God's holy law is not just to show us how we can earn heaven. No, it's not that at all. The work of the, of the Lord's law is to show us that we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. And it drives us to fear because of our ungodliness. It is Jesus only who takes away our fears and removes our sin. It's not our good life. It's not our attempts to improve ourselves. It's not our promises to make stronger efforts. No, it is Jesus only that makes peace between us and our God. And we are safe and secure before God because of Jesus only. In this transfiguration story, we see a clear transition a clear transition from the season of Epiphany to Lent. We find it in verse 9. They were coming down, and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. I like to refer to the epistle reading, the first part of the epistle reading from Second Peter. Peter himself says these very words. No doubt he kept the Lord's command and waited until after the resurrection. And, but here's what he says. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the mountain. It was Jesus only that empowered those three disciples to do what they would do in their lives. We know that Peter, in up against the opposition against Christ, he said to the leaders of the Jewish people that there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. It's Jesus only. And we know that Stephen was the first martyr, the first Christian martyr, but James was the first to be martyred of the apostles, that very James who was on the mountain. And because of Jesus only, he would not deny his faith and trust in him. And so because of that, he was thrown off the temple and was killed. And John, who lived to be, to be an old man, he lived with this teaching of Jesus only. And we see it all over his writings that are moved by the Holy Spirit. We sang it just before the sermon today. 
before the Holy Gospel today. We find this in John chapter 20 where he says, These things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you would have life in his name. God bless you, and we are blessed because of Jesus only. May he strengthen us and keep us close to him. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.